Imagine gliding across the landscape at almost 400 miles per hour on a train that floats above its tracks. No bumps, no wheels clattering, just a whisper quiet whoosh. This is the promise of magnetic levitation, or maglev trains, that are quickly turning into reality. Japan and China are breaking speed records. Meanwhile, Western projects struggle to even lay down conventional high-speed rails on time. But how does maglev technology actually work? What are the engineering marvels behind it? And why has Asia surged ahead while the West is left behind? Nowhere has high-speed rail transformed mobility more than in Asia. Japan lit the spark in 1964 with the Shinkansen bullet trains. And in recent decades, China built an extensive web of high-speed rail lines linking its vast cities. Today, China's high-speed rail network is the longest in the world, accounting for about two-thirds of all high-speed rail globally. These fast electric trains, many based on imported French, German and Japanese designs, cruise at 186 to 217 miles per hour, 300 to 350 kilometers an hour, and have reshaped travel for millions. This boom in Asian rail wasn't just about conventional trains, though. It set the stage for an even more futuristic leap. Magnetic levitation trains, which replace wheels with magnetic force for a frictionless ride. In 2004, China's Shanghai Transrapid Maglev line opened and stunned the world. Using German-developed magnets and a dedicated guideway, the Shanghai Maglev train connects Shanghai Pudong Airport to the city center a 19-mile, 30-kilometer trip that it blazes through in just 7.5 minutes, reaching peak speeds of 268 miles per hour, 431 kilometers an hour. It remains the fastest commercial train on Earth. This project showcased Maglev's potential. The train floats about half an inch above the track, eliminating wheel-rail contact and thus virtually all rolling resistance. The ride is smooth and whisper-quiet at speeds that would make a jet jealous. China had proven that magnetically levitated travel works in the real world, a milestone no Western country has yet achieved in public service. Japan, meanwhile, was innovating its own form of maglev. Building on decades of research since the 1970s, Japan Railways developed the SC maglev, superconducting maglev, an ambitious plan to connect Tokyo, Nagoya and Osaka. In 2015, Japan's experimental L0 series maglev train clocked an incredible 374 miles per hour, 603 kilometers an hour on a test track, a new world record for any train. Although not yet open to passengers, the first segment of Japan's SC maglev line from Tokyo to Nagoya, around 178 miles or 286 kilometers, is under construction. When finished, which is now expected by 2034 due to delays, the line will cut a journey that normally takes 100 minutes down to about 40 minutes by maglev. It's a showcase of cutting-edge Japanese engineering, featuring superconducting magnets that allow the train to levitate a full 4 inches 10 centimeters above the guideway at speed. Despite its hefty price tag and challenges, this project shows Asia's determination to push rail technology to its limits. South Korea has also joined the club on a smaller scale. Since 2016, a low-speed urban maglev in Incheon ferries airport travelers at around 70 miles per hour, 110 kilometers an hour, on a 6-mile, 10-kilometer line. However, it is China and Japan that dominate. But how exactly do these gravity-defying trains work? At the heart of every maglev train is an elegant bit of physics. Magnetic repulsion and attraction. By harnessing electromagnets, maglev systems lift and propel trains without any wheels. This occurs through several key components and principles. Magnetic levitation. Magnetic levitation is delivered by powerful magnets on the train and in the guideway that generate forces that lift the train off the track. There are two main levitation methods. In electromagnetic suspension or EMS systems, like Germany's Transrapid design that's used in Shanghai, Electromagnets on the underside of the train attract it upward toward a steel track, maintaining a tiny air gap about 0.6 inches or 15 millimeters. Sensitive control systems constantly adjust the magnet's strength to keep the train hovering at the right distance. 
This active feedback is needed because the magnetic attraction grows stronger as the gap closes. The benefit of EMS is that levitation works even at a standstill, so the train can float at all speeds. By contrast, Japan's electrodynamic suspension, EDS, uses a different trick. The maglev train itself has onboard superconducting magnets cooled to cryogenic temperatures. To move forward, maglevs don't use engines in the traditional sense. Instead, the track itself acts as a long motor. Magnets on the train and alternating electric currents in coils in the guideway create a linear motor that pulls the train along. Think of it like a rolling magnetic wave that the train surfs. As the train speeds up, its powerful magnets induce currents in those track coils, causing the train to lift about 4 inches 10 centimeters off the track at around 93 miles per hour. Additional sets of coils propel the train forward via magnetic attraction and repulsion. By 150 miles per hour, the wheels are fully retracted and the train is levitating and locked in position by magnetic forces. In trials, this system has proven astonishingly fast while remaining stable enough that a coin balanced on the floor would reportedly stay upright at 300 miles per hour. How does a maglev train stay centered and not slip off the track? The same magnets that levitate and propel also serve to guide. In EMS systems, the train wraps around the guide rail and lateral stability is achieved by the shape of the track and placement of magnets. In EDS systems like Japan's, the track coils are often arranged in a figure-eight configuration. If the train drifts off-center, uneven induction currents create restoring forces that nudge it back to the middle. Essentially, the magnetic design is self-correcting. Any sideways motion induces currents that push the vehicle back into alignment. The result is a train that can hurtle down a guideway at hundreds of miles per hour, yet stay perfectly on course without direct physical guidance. Of course, advanced sensor and computer systems also monitor the train's position in real time to adjust lift and guidance magnets as needed, ensuring a stable ride even through curves and wind gusts. The only significant force the train feels at speed is aerodynamic drag. Maglevs still have to push air aside, which is why ultra-high-speed designs are sleek and bullet-nosed to minimize resistance. All these systems come together to create a remarkable experience, a train that does not touch the rail, accelerating smoothly with no grinding wheels. Aboard a maglev, passengers feel a gentle lift and then an uncanny quiet as the usual vibration of a train disappears. Maglevs also have lower maintenance needs on the vehicles, no wheels or axles to wear out, and can reduce track maintenance, though the infrastructure costs are high up front since an entirely specialised guideway is required. Asia's maglev and high-speed rail accomplishments stand in stark contrast to the struggles faced in the West. Projects in the US and UK have often been mired in delays, budget overruns and political obstacles. The result is a widening gap. Consider the United States. America led the world in many past infrastructure booms. But when it comes to high-speed rail, it has lagged severely. The flagship attempt is the California High-Speed Rail, a plan to connect Los Angeles to San Francisco with trains up to 220 miles per hour. Approved by voters in 2008 with a budget of $33 billion, the project has since ballooned to an estimated $128 billion and counting. After years of slow progress, only a 171-mile segment in the Central Valley is under construction, and even that won't be operational until at least the 2030s, nearly two decades behind schedule. Politicians have disparaged it as a train to nowhere as costs mounted. Similarly, in the densely populated Northeast Corridor, a private consortium has proposed a Washington DC to Baltimore maglev line using Japan's SC maglev technology. In theory, this line could whisk passengers between the cities in 15 minutes and eventually connect DC to New York in an hour. However, it has been stalled by environmental reviews and funding challenges. In mid-2025, the US federal government effectively halted the environmental review of the Northeast maglev project putting it on indefinite hold. Despite interest and even an offer from Japan to partly finance the route, the American maglev vision remains a paper proposal with an uncertain future. Across the Atlantic, Britain's experience has been similarly fraught. The UK's High Speed 2 HS2 project, 
a conventional high-speed rail line from London to the Midlands and North, was meant to be Europe's latest rail marvel. But after a decade of planning and construction, HS2's budget has exploded from about £33 billion, or $44 billion, to over £100 billion, more than $125 billion. And its timeline has slipped dramatically. The initial segment to Birmingham, originally slated for 2026, is now delayed well beyond 2030. Worse, the government cancelled the northern leg to Manchester in 2023 after costs became untenable. British officials admitted to appalling mismanagement and lack of cost control in a project that was supposed to showcase modern rail prowess. Even Germany, the birthplace of maglev technology, built only a short test track and never opened a high-speed maglev line at home. A planned Munich Airport Transrapid line was cancelled in 2008 amid cost concerns. The only operational maglev in Western Europe was a low-speed shuttle in the 1980s at Birmingham Airport, UK. It closed in 1995 due to reliability issues. In essence, Western nations have been cautious about adopting maglev, often favouring upgrades to existing rail or none at all. So why is Asia succeeding where others falter? Several factors emerge. Political will and long-term planning have been crucial. In China, the central government treated high-speed rail as a strategic priority, investing hundreds of billions of dollars and cutting through red tape to lay over 25,000 miles of fast lines in about 15 years. Authoritarian efficiency meant fewer delays in land acquisition and permitting. Japan, a democracy, moved more deliberately, but still benefits from a culture that values rail travel and continuous improvements since the Shinkansen's debut. Japanese engineers methodically perfected maglev technology over decades in government-funded research centers. When it came time to build the Chuo Shinkansen maglev, the government and JR Central were willing to commit 50 to 60 plus billion dollars to the first phase alone. That kind of financial commitment and consensus is hard to find in the West. In the US, by contrast, high-speed rail proposals often fall victim to partisan shifts and local opposition. Funding must survive annual budget fights and projects get bogged down by lawsuits and environmental reviews that, while important, can add years. The Northeast Maglev proposal illustrates this. Despite private backing and foreign support, it faces skepticism about cost, ridership and impacts on communities, which so far have kept it in limbo. Another factor is population density and travel demand. Asian countries have corridors with megacities where tens of millions travel between city centres. Ideal conditions for high-speed rail and maglev to be cost-effective. In Japan, the Tokyo-Osaka route is so busy that the maglev is justified as a way to add capacity and dramatically cut travel times. China's coastal metropolises similarly needed relief from clogged airports and highways, and bullet trains now carry billions of passenger trips per year. In parts of the West, intercity travel demand is met well by existing routes. The US is a prime example. Its cities are spread further apart and car culture is strong, making it harder to justify the enormous expense of new rail lines for moderate populations. Except in the Northeast, which is exactly where the only US maglev was proposed. Europe has several successful high-speed rail lines, such as France's TGV and Germany's ICE, but even there, Extending an entirely new maglev network might not deliver enough benefit over already 185 mile per hour trains for the cost involved. Meaning that Western governments have been hesitant to take the leap that Asia has. There's also technological and industrial focus. China and Japan view high-speed rail and maglev as industries to lead in, exporting their expertise abroad. Chinese firms now build high-speed rail in many countries, and Japan aggressively pitches its maglev and bullet train tech overseas. The competition between the two has spurred innovation. In the West, rail manufacturing is less of a national priority. The US buys trains from others. It doesn't nurture its own high-speed rail companies at scale. Without that strategic drive, big projects lose momentum. Lastly, we must note that maglev is not a cure-all. Even in Asia, it faces challenges. The Shanghai Maglev, for all its speed, remained a one-off showcase. Plans to extend it stalled due to high costs, over a billion dollars for just 19 miles, and public concerns about noise and electromagnetic emissions. 
China opted to build most of its high-speed network with conventional steel wheel trains, which are cheaper and interoperable nationwide. Japan's Maglev 2 has run into local environmental opposition. Construction was delayed by at least seven years because of concerns about tunnel impacts on water stables in Shizuka Prefecture. So while Asia is ahead, it is not without setbacks. What distinguishes Asia's efforts is that despite these hurdles, the commitment to the end goal hasn't wavered. The general trajectory remains full steam, or rather full electromagnetism, ahead. The story of maglev trains and high-speed rail is a story of trade-offs and vision. Maglev technology promises extraordinary speeds, smoother rides, and potentially lower maintenance in the long run. It represents the pinnacle of what ground transport can achieve. Trains cruising at over 300 miles per hour, rivaling jet aircraft in city center to city center travel time, with environmental benefits and stimulate economic activity by knitting regions closer together. Asia's leadership in this arena shows what is possible when there is alignment of political will, public transport, and engineering ambition. However, the future of maglev and high-speed rail will depend on addressing key challenges. Cost is the towering hurdle. These systems require billions up front. Not every nation can afford to spend 50 to 100 billion dollars on a single line, nor is it always sensible to do so. Maglev trains can't use existing railway tracks. They demand entirely new corridors. In places that already have extensive rail networks, jumping to maglev may not justify the expense when modern fast trains, while slower, can run on existing infrastructure. The West struggle also highlights soft factors that enable success. Stable funding, streamlined permitting, and public buy-in. Without these, even the best technology will languish. If Western countries can learn from Asia's example, perhaps by establishing dedicated rail infrastructure banks, enacting faster approval processes for green transportation projects, and communicating the long-term benefits to the public, they might close the gap. Meanwhile, Asia isn't resting. China is experimenting with vacuum tube hyperloop-like maglevs that could push speeds past 600 kilometers an hour. And Japan aims to eventually extend its maglev line all the way to Osaka. By the 2030s, we could see multiple commercial maglev routes in operation in Asia, shrinking travel times further. If those prove safe and economically viable, the pressure will mount on others to catch up or risk falling behind in efficient mobility. In the end, whether high-speed travel comes from steel wheels or magnetic levitation, the goal is the same – to connect people and cities faster and more smoothly than ever before.